Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Johnny and Clyde Big Book Study. We're just two alcoholics who like to study the book, and we invite you guys to come and join us. Participation is welcome. We're going to start out with Shelly coming in and reading a set-aside prayer for us. Hi, I'm Shelly. I'm an alcoholic. God, today, help me set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself everything I think I know about others, and everything I think I know about my own recovery, so that I may have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me see the truth. Thanks. Let me be of service. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. In 1973, Joe McHugh introduced Charlie P. as the AA speaker at an Al-Anon convention. Joe and Charlie soon discovered that they both shared a love for the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Traveling between their homes, discussing the big book became a regular event. So listen, me and Clyde, Johnny and Clyde, uh, met in the zoo crew about two years ago. And we discovered that we loved the big book. And we were asked to um, create a podcast where we could study the big book along with you guys. And so that's why we're here today. We meet every Sunday at 2 p.m. until 3.30 Eastern time in this room. Please have your big book handy and read along as we take notes and study together, underline and, uh, and highlight the things of importance to us in this book. We'll be recording the audio for these meetings to share it with others on our podcast, on the Zoo Crew podcast. So the purpose of the big book study meeting is to help us when we're meeting with a prospect what we call sponsees now, or just talking about sobriety in general. See, we want to be armed with the facts about ourselves and the AA program because freedom from alcohol comes through taking the 12 steps and starting to work with others. Now, this is what the 12 steps are. Page 15 of the 12 and 12. AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in nature, which if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable a sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. So the question of the day is, how soon do you want to be happy, joyous, and free? We suggest that you purchase a copy of the big book if you don't have one for future use. You might want to underline, highlight, and even take notes as we all study together. You can get your AA literature directly from AA so that the money goes to Alcoholics Anonymous and to ensure that you get a good copy. See, here in the original zoo, we're not advocating that you rush through the steps, but we suggest that you have a sense of urgency in taking the 12 steps and have them become a way of life sooner than later. Listen, act as if this was a matter of life and death, because it is actually a matter of life and death. If your house was on fire, you wouldn't call the fire department and tell them, hey, I got this under control. You guys take your time. But that's what we did with our alcoholism. Once again, how soon do you want to be happy, joyous, and free? You could go to our website at thezuku.org to order a copy of the big book, as well as read it online, as well as listen to our podcast. But the big book is our basic text, and it contains the full recipe for recovery. It's impossible to find a loophole in the big book that excludes you from being a member of AA. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Clyde. He's going to bring us up to speed. On where we've been studying, we're on page 26 in the big book. Okay, thank you, cousin. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Clyde, and uh, grateful to be here studying the big book with you guys today. Uh, we're in chapter two, There is a Solution. And uh, just to give you, uh, let's uh, do a quick recap on what we studied last week. Uh, on page 25, at the top of the page, it says in italics, there is a solution. And they're referring to a solution to our problem with alcoholism. And we found out in the middle of the page what the solution is. And it's this. It says the great fact is just this and nothing less. That we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. That is the solution, a deep and effective spiritual experience, okay? And then uh, we went on to read in the next paragraph at the bottom of the page, and I'm going to do a little cross-reference here back to the doctor's opinion. 
And here's what it says, uh, as far as the solution goes, it says, if you're as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle of the road solution. So there's no middle of the road here. It says we were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through, through human aid, we had but two alternatives. So does that sound familiar about life becoming impossible and being beyond human aid? If we go back to the doctor's opinion on Roman numeral 28, it says that uh, once having lost their self-confidence, this is Dr. Silkworth referring to us, having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, there we are beyond human aid, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. That's what happens to us alcoholics. So we, it's a, there's no middle of the road solution. And what it says then is we have two choices, two alternatives. One is to go on to the bitter end, blotting out our consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we can. And the other one is to accept spiritual help. So that's our choice. We can do one or the other. And now we're going to read about this spiritual help. We're going to get an example from a person here. And it's at the top of page 26. We're going to read a nice story about this gentleman. And I'll tell you a little bit about him too. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start at the top of page 26 and learn about this guy's spiritual experience. It's a certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and high character. And this certain American businessman is a gentleman named Roland Hazard III. Really powerful, wealthy businessman, his family. He's named after his grandfather and his father. They owned a textile business from Rhode Island. These guys are big time heavy hitters. And he has a serious drinking problem. So let's read about him. And by the way, he's the first guy, the first person in, in the AA associated with AA to get sober using the Oxford group technique. He passed it on to Ebby Thatcher and then Ebby passed it on to Bill later. So this guy is the beginning of the AA thread, even though I'm not sure he was technically a member of AA. But his story is significant. We're going to read about him now. So a certain American businessman, Roland Hazard, had ability, good sense, and high character. For years, he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. He had consulted the best known American psychiatrist. Money's no object for this guy. He's seeking out the best. Then he had gone to Europe placing himself in the care of a celebrated physician, the psychiatrist, Dr. Young, who prescribed for him. So Dr. Young was one of the top three psychiatrists in the world at the time. So he sought him out. There was uh, Sigmund Freud, this guy named Adler, and then Dr. Young. So He's serious about getting over his drinking problem, Roland Hazard is. So he goes to Europe, I think Switzerland, to be treated by Dr. Jung, who prescribed for him. So though experience had made him skeptical, he's not so sure about it, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. So he was treated, and we think for like up to 12 months. We don't know the frequency of the meetings and whatnot and the treatment, but uh, he finished his treatment with Dr. Young and felt pretty good. Unusual confidence. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. So he had this all figured out now. Dr. Young, through their sessions, was able to explain to him what was going on. And now he understands why he does what he does. And he's got it all figured out in his head, right? So he thought it was unthinkable to relapse. It's like, thank you, I got this. Well, guess what? Nevertheless, 
he was drunk in a short time. <laughs> More let's, bath- let's stop right there. Yes. All right? yes. Let's stop right there. Yes. Let's uh let's talk about this Dr. Young, you know, first off, because he's a very, very important part of what we have here today. Now he was a protege of uh Sigmund Freud. And uh um Roland couldn't get an appointment with Sigmund Freud, so he went to Dr. Young. And Dr. Young believed everything that Sigmund Freud believed, except for one thing. He believed that it was not only mental, but that it was also a spiritual uh, problem that we had. And him and uh, uh, Sigmund Freud clashed on that, so he kind of backed away from him. And uh, in the in the bottom, that is that's that's the perfect example of the one two three shuffle, I think. <laughs> he had acquired such a profound knowledge of his inner workings in his mind and his and the hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. And you said it. He said, I got this thing figured out. I need not to do any more work. I need not to do any more work. I got this thing figured out. Uh, anyone want to come in and share? We got people in here. Who have studied this book too? Uh, what you got out of this, Shelly? Come on in. Um, hi, cousin. I'm Shelly. I'm an alcoholic. I just had a question because I was on the edge of my seat listening as to when you were gonna say, "Oh, but they didn't have a high power involved in that plan," and then you did say it. Uh, but I kind of missed if you could repeat because I know you said they didn't right, think that-, that there was a spiritual element. Yeah. To- Doc, uh, uh, Dr. Jung was, was actually a protege of uh, Sigmund Freud, meaning that he was under Sigmund Freud. He was learning from him. But where they differed at is that uh, Dr. Jung had found out through working with, um, with people that there was also a spiritual component to this thing, that it wasn't all mental, that they were also spiritually sick. And they're going to talk about that as, as we read on. But that's when they they actually differed on that, you know. They clashed. That that's the key. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. So Dr. Jung, you know, he played a huge part in in what we have today, you know, because before that, you know, uh, we were we were told that it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. So he he added the next component. Yeah. And he added it through experience. He didn't figure it out. It was from working with people and working with people. And I guess people came to him and then people would, would, you know, religious people would come to him, I guess. And he'd be working on their minds and they'd be talking about God. And he could see that he could see how how they two could work together and come up with a solution. So he started to you started to suggest that to people as they came to him after that. Right, Clyde? Yeah. So here, boy, what a great segue for what I want to share. On page 23, we read that, therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. So it is in our mind. The problem is our sick, chronic alcoholic mind can't fix its chronic alcoholic mind. Our sick mind can't cure our sick mind. You can't make our mind well enough. We need a power greater than ourselves to do that. We're going to read all about it. But yes, that's why all the emphasis was on the mind. It is the main problem of ours does center in our mind, but we can't fix it on our own. So, okay. So uh, he thought he could see that's what exactly what happened. He, it was unthinkable. He's got it all figured out his mind. He figured it out. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. And more baffling still is he could give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. He has no idea why. He he just, he relapsed. He's like, dang, you know, what just happened? So here's what he did. He returned to this doctor whom he admired and asked him point blank why he could not recover. So he goes back to Jung. He says, hey, doc, what's up, man? He says he wished above all things to regain self-control. Roland is like 50 years old at this point. He's been struggling with alcoholism for a long time. It has been tearing this guy up. 
damaging his reputation, damaging his family, uh, his family name, his business. I mean, it's really been causing trouble for the guy and he desperately wants to regain self-control. And he's, he seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems. So he can handle his life fine. It's this alcoholism thing that's killing him, though. He said he had no control, whatever, over alcohol. Why was this? Question. Question. So why does he have no control, whatever, over alcohol? That's a question. So he's going to ask the doctor. Next paragraph. He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. So here's what Young told him. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society, and he would have to place himself under lock and key or hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. This was a great physician's opinion. Wow. So Dr. Young said, Roland, you are effed. There's no hope for you. Uh, it, it, you can't be get over this. It's too much. And, but get this. Here's the good news. This man still lives and is a free man. Imagine that. Can't wait to hear how he did that. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on this earth where other free men may go without disaster, provided... He remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. Ding! <laughs> what is that simple attitude that we know today? Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. Those are the okay. three indispensables, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... Should we go ahead and continue studying here? This no, come on in, Shelly, and share with us. Yeah, come on in. Sorry, no. I thought. Um, and, uh, by, by the way, <laughs> by, by the way, put that put that in your notes there. It's yeah, the it's the, the how honesty, open mindedness, and willingness. But I thought you were gonna say, trust God, clean the house, and help others. Uh, th those are their cousins. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, if, if you know, I put a note of of either I have on honesty, open mindedness, and willingness, and now I'm going to actually put those notes that you gave me too. So I'll have two. Yes. two answers. It can still ring the bell. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. If anybody else wants to share, come on in. You're welcome. But we're going to learn. So the doctor told him, you don't have a chance. You're hopeless. And yet we find out that he did recover. And we're going to find out how. Um, he has a certain simple attitude. We're going to learn about it now. So we'll keep studying here. We're at the top of page 27. And it says, some of our alcoholic readers may think they can do without spiritual help. Is that you? We ask yourself, be honest. Do you think you can get over and recover from alcoholism without spiritual help? Well, if you do, let us tell you the rest of the conversation our friend had with his doctor. So you're going to want to pay attention to this. And here's what uh, Young told Roland. He said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. So I took the liberty of looking up the definition of the word chronic. And chronic means continuing or occurring again and again for a long time. Chronic. And it also means always present or encountered. That means it's a deep-seated permanent thing. Chronic alcoholic. The mind, his mind is... he. So he, so let's check it out. He says, I have never seen one single case recover where that state of mind existed to the extent that it does in you. Now, who can relate with that? Because I'm telling you, 
that I've got a chronic alcoholic mind that is off the charts on a scale from one to a hundred, I'm a hundred and fifty. <laughs> I mean, I'm with this guy, you know, I'm, I'm a serious case of a chronic alcoholic mind. So I know I'm going to need spiritual help. No question about it. Is there anybody here that doesn't have a chronic alcoholic mind and thinks that they can recover without spiritual help? Okay, so let's keep reading. And so uh, Young told him, you know, you got this extreme alcoholic mind, chronic, and I've never seen anybody recover with that level of chronic alcoholic mind you have. So Rowan's, it says, our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang. So he gulped real hard and just sunk like, oh my gosh. So he said to the doctor, is there no exception? Like, oh gosh, doc, isn't there any exception ever? And guess what? Yes, replied the doctor, there is. Ding, 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 ding. We're going to learn what the exception is to somebody like me and Roland with this extreme chronic alcoholic mind. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. Here and there, once in a while, so it's very rare, here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. Ding, 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 ding. That's the solution right there. And they happen here and there once in a while says to me these occurrences are phenomena you guys want to know what a phenomena is i looked up that definition too so it's an unusual it's typically an unusual or difficult to understand or explain it so it's a rare thing it doesn't happen very often they're rare and they're difficult to understand or explain so a phenomena so this is miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> yes. We don't know where it comes for, no where it comes or when it comes, but it comes. You know, we don't know where it comes. Yeah, it's a it's it's a miracle. Phenomenon is a miracle, also. Yes, it is. And so here's what it is. Here's what a, a vital spiritual experience. Here's what this phenomena is. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. And here's the key right here. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side, and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. Ding, ding, ding. That's it. You only have to change one thing, and that's everything. <laughs> Your ideas, emotions, and attitudes need to be changed to a completely new way of doing things. And last week, last week, uh, um, uh, Regina was here with us, and and uh, she gave us the de the what we call that. That is a personality. Our personality is our ideas, our emotions. What is it? Our ideas, our feelings, and our um, and our attitudes, right? Behavior, behavior, yeah. yeah. Behavior. Actions. Yep. So our personality, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, come on in and share with us, Tracy. Hey, you. You're still muted. Yeah. Hi. Um, I want to know. Uh, have you? said the definition of phenomenon yes well what what is it okay i'll post it in the chat oh great okay yeah. thank you. i'll put it in the chat for you it's it's uh, a rare occurrence that only happens once in a while it's a rare occurrence that only happens happens once in a while slash miracle yeah yeah phenomenon means the same thing as miracle basically um, yeah yeah. Huh. If you look up miracle and you look up phenomenon, they're basically the same. We don't know. We don't know when a miracle happens nor how. 
and it doesn't happen all the time. A phenomenon, almost the same. It's a rare occurrence that almost almost never happens, <laughs> but it does. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They even have, if you, you look at them side by side in the dictionary, they have very similar meanings. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, somebody, Loretta, Mama Bear, you had your hand up. Did you want to share too? Are you? You're, you're still muted. Okay. You want to wait? Okay. Great. All right. So, um, yeah, that's what a spiritual um, awakening is. That's the solution to alcoholism. It's our old ideas, emotions, and attitudes that get cast aside. Uh, they're suddenly cast to one side and replaced with a completely new set of conceptions and motives. That's the solution. And when we take the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's the outcome. God does that for us. It's a miracle. So here's what he said. Here's what Roland, I mean, uh, Dr. Young said. In fact, said, I've been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangement within you. So with many individuals, the methods which I employed are successful, but I have never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. Hmm. Yeah, meaning he's so far off the charts with this chronic alcoholic mind and so out of control that is and, and 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 right there that line that you just read is what makes him the exception and the leader of the aa pack read that again yeah it says with many individuals the methods which i employed are successful but i have never been successful with an alcoholic of your description a well, real he was about alcohol. to. He yep. was about to. <laughs> That's right. Isn't that amazing? That's yeah. what makes Roland Hazard the leader of the pack. Yes, yep. he's the leader of the pack. Isn't a that breakthrough. A breakthrough in someone as sick as him. The doctor That's... never saw anybody as sick as him recover. Yes, yes. That's right. So upon hearing this, now check this out. Uh, we just read a story in the back of the big book yesterday at the meeting, and I'm going to share a line with you after we read this. So listen to, here's what Roland felt like when he heard that uh, about this spiritual thing. He said, upon hearing this, our friend was somewhat relieved, for he reflected that after all, he was a good church member. He's like, oh, cool, spiritual experience. I can do that. I go to church every Sunday. I'm a good uh, church going, you know, Bible carrying member. No problem. Well, this hope, however, was destroyed by the doctors telling him that while his religious convictions were very good, in his case, they did not spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. So are you saying that they're two different things, Clyde? The spiritual experience and being a church member? Yeah, they're two different things, cousin. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yes. And, and you know what? You know what that brings me to? That 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 brings that brings me to uh what what we had uh found out in in reading the book about uh sincerity, sincerity, you know, and and I and I think that that's that's where um Roland had his breakthrough because he already talked about it. he knows God, you know. I've I've been going to church uh for for years. But but I, I I believe that uh, that that bit of sincerity is what is what helped him to break through. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. There's the sincerity. There's the so here's the deal. The twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are what really grooves and hones that relationship with God or higher power that where he can get in there and do the transformation and give us this vital spiritual experience. It's the 12 steps that really make that happen. That's the result of taking the 12 steps. That relationship with God gets so good and, and we allow him in there to make the necessary changes and give us the spiritual awakening and spiritual experience, uh, whichever the case may be. Come on in Loretta. Mama Bear. Thank you, Clyde. I'm Loretta Mama Bear, and I'm definitely an alcoholic. But yeah, that last statement about his religion, I mean, 
I've tried going to church and it just never worked for me. However, my higher power, whom I called my father, brought me to a point of bringing me, to, taking away that desire, taking away that last drink, and then bringing me into these uh, rooms. And that's why I'm able for this day only, I can only speak for, I could stay sober. But it wasn't church. It wasn't religion people, religious people, or anything like that. I mean, they're all nice. They're all good. However, they didn't help me. Only my higher power, whom I choose to call Father, brought me into these rooms and brought me to my recovery that I'm experiencing on this journey of uh, permanent recovery. Thank you very much for letting me share. Peace out. Thank you for sharing with us, Loretta. We're, we're glad you're and, here with us. And, and another thing, Clyde. Remember that uh, he didn't have the 12 steps. He didn't even have the six steps. What he had been given while he was going to church and attending Oxford group meetings were those four uh, um, precepts. And could you tell us those? Yeah, so the, the, the four, four absolutes. absolutes. He the had the four, four absolutes. The, the four absolutes that the Oxford group adhered to were honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. That was the four absolutes. And then they they had a program. They had some uh, a process you could go through. It was six steps you could take to have a, a spiritual transformation. And that's what Rowan ended up doing with the Oxford group. And he did get sober using their technique. And then he shared it with Abby. And then Ebby's the one that shared it with Bill. And that's what blew the barn door wide open for us, the rest of us here. This is the first case. And he'd been trying for years to get well. And he finally got well using the Oxford group technique. But at this point, not yet, we're still reading about his story. We, it's been two full pages now. And he thought, okay, I'm a religious man. I got this. And Dr. Young said, not so fast. Just going to church on Sunday isn't going to give you that vital spiritual experience. So it, let's turn the page. Top of page 28. Here was the terrible dilemma in which our friend found himself. So he, he was in a pickle uh, when he had the extraordinary experience, which, as we have already told you, made him a free man. So what he did was he, he accepted the spiritual help and did the Oxford group program. And, and he had the vital spiritual experience and got him sober. It worked. The, the, the spiritual program of action that the Oxford group used worked for Roland Hazard III. So that's the first guy. Um, I, like Cousin said, he was the... The, what did you call him? How did you refer to him about being our first guy? He he was he was the breakthrough. Yeah, the breakthrough. the breakthrough. Yes, yeah, he was the breakthrough. Yeah. Now, Clyde, you know something that just came to me, and 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 I don't know this. Who wrote the six steps? Good wow. question. Google that. Let's find that out today. Who wrote the six steps? We know the Oxford group had the four absolutes. Who wrote yeah. the six steps? Yeah, here, let's look. Who wrote the six steps of the Oxford? I'm Googling it as we speak. We'll see what comes That's up. That's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, so let's see who wrote it. Frank. So Frank Buckman. Uh, was their was their leader? He was like the chief uh, pastor minister. Buckman, I'm looking through here. Um, spiritual primary, the four absolutes, spiritual practices, the five C's, house parties, slogans, literature. Let's see. You know what? We may have to to do a little research on this and, and bringing, I'll bring it up in the summary recap for next week. It, it's That's not everybody, everybody, let's all go check that out and come back next week with an answer. Okay. 
Yeah, that's that's good stuff. I, yeah, that yeah. is, that is okay. Okay, so um, he was able to get recover and have a spiritual experience by mm -hmm. using their technique. And so, here's what it says about us: page twenty eight, top of the page, second paragraph. We. So he's referring to now the we that they're talking about is the first 70 to 100 alcoholics that recovered. When this book was written, there were 70 to 100 sober recovered alcoholics. So we, the first 100, we'll round it, in our turn, sought the same escape with all the desperation of drowning men. They wanted the same escape Roland enjoyed. What seemed at first a flimsy read has proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. A new life has been given us, or if you prefer, a design for living that really works. So that's the solution. Uh, he says, the distinguished American psychologist, William James, by the way, Bill uh, got a copy of this book and read it in the hospital before he left. He checked in on December 11th, 1934, and he checked out around December 18th, 1934. He had his spiritual experience around the 14th or the 15th of December. And he read this book before he left, the William James Varieties of Religious Experience. And it indicates a multitude of ways in which men have discovered God. It says, we have no desire. So check this out. We have no desire to convince anyone that there's only one way by which faith can be acquired. So there are other ways to acquire faith in God. It says, if what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, are the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms. As soon as we are, ding, 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 cousin brought it up earlier, willing and honest enough to try. Those having religious affiliations will find here nothing disturbing to their beliefs or ceremonies. There is no friction among us over such matters. So we can all acquire faith, all of us. On, we can form a relationship with a higher power on simple and understandable terms. That is the solution. And that's it what, looks like. Yeah, it looks like this is the precursor to step two, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, coming to believe that this uh, you can form a relationship with simple and understandable terms with a higher power. Absolutely. This is the beginning uh, trappings of the second step coming to believe, for sure. Because it says, we have no desire to convince anyone that there is only one way by which faith can be accomplished. As soon as a man can say he believes or is willing to believe, we let him know that he is on his way. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. You're on your way to forming a relationship with a higher power with simple and understandable terms. As long as you're willing, there's the key word right there. It says as, as soon as we are willing and honest and open-mindedness is huge too. That's what that chapter four, we agnostics coming to believe is all about open-mindedness. Just give it a shot. Try it out. Try some, try doing things in a different way, but just do what we do and see what happens. <laughs> so, okay. So it says, we think it no concern of ours, what religious bodies our members identify themselves with as individuals. This should be an entirely personal affair, which each one decides for himself in the light of past associations or his present choice. And here, if you got a problem with the God thing, no problem. It says not all of us join religious bodies, but most of us favor such memberships. So not everyone does. Bill was not a member of organized religion. Dr. Bob was. Dr. Bob was a devout Christian and studied the Bible and was member of church. Bill was not. He believed in the spirit of the universe, you know, some underlying creative intelligence. It doesn't matter. 
Mm. So it says in the following chapter, there appears an explanation of alcoholism. That's chapter three, more about alcoholism. Uh, as we understand it, then a chapter addressed to the agnostic. That's chapter four, we agnostics. So they're letting us know there's two more chapters coming up, more about alcoholism and we agnostics. Many who were once in this class are now among our members. So if you're an agnostic or even an atheist, no problem. Keep reading. Surprisingly enough, we find such convictions no great obstacle to a spiritual experience. So there's no loopholes here. If you say, hey, I'm an agnostic, I'm an atheist, I'm not going for this God thing, program's not going to work for me, you're wrong. I'll read it again. Surprisingly enough, we find such convictions no great obstacle to a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Have an open mind, be willing, be honest, and you'll have no obstacles to your spiritual experience. You'll have a simple and understandable relationship with a higher power. Just take the steps and trust the process. And here's how. Check this out. Oh, I love this. <laughs> this book is so well written. God, God wrote this book through Bill's hand. Man, this is good stuff. Listen to this. So after we read chapter three, more about alcoholism, now that we know what the solution is, and we read chapter four about we agnostics, it says further on, Clear cut directions are given showing how we recovered. So check that out. Chapter five, how it works. Chapter that's six, right. Into action. That's Chapter right. seven, working with others. <clears throat> okay, so those chapters are coming on. Those are the clear cut directions to recover from alcoholism. Chapter five, how it works. Chapter six, into action. Chapter seven, working with others. And then there's more chapters after that. And those are followed by 42 personal experiences. Now, listen to this. These personal stories in the back of the book are really important and really powerful and effective. Here's what they do. It says each individual, this is referring to the personal stories in the back of the book. Each, each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view, the way he established his relationship with God. So check this out. If you're one of these people that has a problem with the God thing, read those stories and you're going to be surprised how you relate to some of those people. And you're going to realize that, wow, he felt just like I do. And how did he do that? You'll learn all about it. This is helpful. It says these give a fair cross section of our membership and a clear cut idea of what has actually happened in their lives. Wow, that is unbelievable. And so it says, we hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need, that's me, I'm an alcoholic, a real alcoholic, and I'm desperately in need of help, will see these pages. And we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems, sounds like the fifth step to me, that they will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. So when we read those stories in the back, we can relate and identify and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm one of those. That's me. I, I got to have this. It's working for you guys so well. I want it to work for me. I'll do it. Show me what to do. This is great. So who wants to share about the solution? Is everybody clear on, it doesn't say there are solutions. It doesn't say there is, uh, you know, a couple ways to do this. It's there is a solution. It's called a vital spiritual experience, a personality change. And our higher power will do that for us. As long as we just follow the clear-cut directions. That's what we just learned. Who wants to share? There we are. Mama Bear, come on in. Thank you, Clyde. I'm, I'm curious. Now, we have the, I have the four absolutes by the Oxford group. And what was the other one? The six what? 
the six steps. We're going to find out who wrote the fix the six steps. Before Bill wrote the 12 steps, we're going to find out who wrote the six steps. And the six steps are on page 263. Okay, let's read them. And uh, we're going to do our research, and everybody's going to come back here by next week knowing who wrote them. The six steps before the 12 steps were written were, one, complete deflation, two, dependence and guidance from a higher power, three, a moral inventory, four, confession, five, restitution, and six, to continue to work with other alcoholics. We're going to find out who wrote those. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, that'd be good to know. Let's get some yeah, more. John, Josh, come on in. I think Josh knows. Tell us who wrote those, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Blair, I'm an alcoholic, and I do not. That was a, that's a really good question. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's I'm just sitting here thinking about how amazingly simple these uh, this program can be distilled down into the you know going back to the oxford group and those four tenants you know the honesty purity um you know uh service and uh what was the other one cuz unselfishness (laughs) is selflessness Uh, selfishness the most important one yeah (laughs) yeah you know i mean it's just amazing i need it simple like that you know I love uh, love Dr. Bob's Trust God, Clean House, Help Others, you know. Uh, it, it just keeps it really, really simple. Uh, and I'm just so grateful. I, I just wanted to come in and say I love you guys. And uh, this is a great study. Thanks for letting me be here. Yeah, thank you for coming, man. We need you here. We need everybody here. You know, we're right, we, we'll be going on to the next chapter next week, right, more about alcoholism. And what we encourage you to do is cheat on the test. What we want you to do is read ahead, find out whatever you can find out about what we're going to read, and then come in and share it with us. You know, uh, you know that's what this thing is about. And we're not going to leave this chapter without, um, <clears throat> without seeing why we drank. <laughs> Remember, we were talking about that for the last few weeks because I needed to know that. Now, the big book tells us on uh, page 28 in the Roman numerals, see if you can identify with this. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. They like to get high, right? And the second part is, Clyde, what is that? That our problem, that once, once the habit is, has taken, once we, once we get the habit, yeah. uh, our problems pile up on us and it becomes astonishingly difficult to, to solve them. And this just said that in the end of this too. It says, our hope is that many alcoholics who definitely need it will see and will believe that only by fully disclosing our problems that they may be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them and I want this thing too. Ain't that something? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and we, we're learning that uh, <clears throat> the simplicity of this program and as we keep coming, we keep reading this book, how that's repeated time and time again. Let's talk about getting honest, fully disclosing our problems, fully disclosing our problems. And, and that's why I stayed drunk, because I thought that I could handle things on my own and I, I, I could fix myself, you know? So uh, we, we learned how to stop bullshitting and, and say, hey, when, when I came back from a relapse, I'd give you guys all of these stories about the dog died, the boss was mean, the wife didn't like me anymore, the kids didn't go to school. When the bottom line was, I, I, I like to get high. And, and I wanted to get high more than I wanted to stay sober, number one. And number two, there were people who had the same problems as me that didn't drink. Ain't that something? They had the same problems and worse than me that didn't drink. But what I did was I let my problems pile up and pile up and pile up until I couldn't do anything about them by myself. What do you guys think of that? Two yeah. reasons why we drink. We want to get high and we allow our problems. And you know what? That was something that was given to me early on when I asked, uh, <clears throat> I asked somebody with decades of sobriety how they stayed sober. And that was one of the points that they pointed out to me. They said they don't hold anything in. When something's going on, 
they start working on it right away. That was that that was you know what they did. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's get some questions, some comments, some conversation. Let's talk to one another. We got a few minutes. Clyde, we're going to start the next chapter next week. We're not going to start today because we want to start that fresh. That's so, good. Uh, Let's just kick it about what we've read. What do you find in the chapter? There's a solution. And what is this chapter really all about? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I, I'll go ahead and share real quick about the, the key of this certain simple attitude, just what you're talking about, to open up. So here, check it out. You know, we promote four things here at the Zoo Crew about getting sober and recovering from alcoholism and you hear it all the time and cousin does such a great job of mentioning it over and over and over and the reason he keeps mentioning it is because it is so important and so powerful and effective one is to get a home group and get to know the people in the home group and let them get to know you that is a big part so this ties in with the willingness honesty and open-mindedness you want to be honest with the group don't act like you're all that in a bag of chips. Be honest, okay? And let us get to know you, and and you'll get to know us, okay? Uh, get a sponsor in a big book and take the 12 steps. Man, that's the game changer, like Josh calls it. That's where the magic <laughs> really happens. Get a big book and a sponsor and take the 12 steps. And then another really important thing is to get into service, start working with other alcoholics, be of service to the zoo crew community or your in-person meetings or both and, and, and start sponsoring people, taking people through the steps and, and just get us, get yourself a big book and another alcoholic to be your running buddy and read the book together and study it. That's what cousin Jonathan and I are doing. We're just studying the book together. We love it. And it's just getting more and more ingrained into us. And our spiritual awakenings are getting deeper and deeper and greater and greater as a result. You just keep at it. So that's that's the formula. And the key is to be willing to do the work. It's not hard work, guys. We get to do it. And, and be honest and be open-minded to take some suggestions and try doing things differently. It, it works. It really does. Come on in and share it, Josh, brother Josh. Hey, what's up, fam? Josh Blair, alcoholic, and yeah, that's that's right on, uh, Clyde. That's that's beautiful, man. And uh, yeah, this is a great place to do that. The Zoo Crew, a lot of opportunities to do service work. I just want to talk about the attitude that they're talking about. Uh, that attitude uh, change, uh, from my experience, was like I was living life for myself. You know, what could I get? What could I get, you know? Uh, I, I was a taker, you know? And this program teaches us how to be givers, you know? Switch that attitude from me, me, me to we, you know? And I and that's where the real miracle comes in. You, you take these steps, and all of a sudden, God is doing for me what I can't do for myself. And that main thing is, A, not picking up a drink or a drug to solve my problems and to get high. You know, to escape reality. And then uh and then the the second one being the second miracle being I'm able to help out other people today. Like <laughs> what? <laughs> That's a real miracle right there. I'm able to get out of myself, climb out of my cave, and be a part of life and be uh, of maximum service to, to God and my fellows. It's just awesome, you know. Uh, so yeah, the zoo crew is a great place. It offers, uh, you know, uh, service opportunities all day long, all day long. doesn't matter how much time you have. It caters to the newcomer. And that's what I love most about this. Cause that's what the program is it's about helping the newcomers. And, uh, yeah, that's how we stay sober. So thanks. Let me share. Okay, cool. Hey, Mo. Linda, Ken, Kelly, Janet, we want to hear from you guys, too. What do you think of all this that we're talking about today? Come on in. <laughs> I, I, I want to just mention two points about what Josh just said and this attitude. Here's the, uh, the simple attitude. Uh, page 20, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant 
thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. It's not the Clyde show anymore. The universe doesn't revolve around Clyde. Anymore. <laughs> I'm a worker among workers. I'm a performing my role for the benefit of the team. I have the team's best interest at heart now instead of mine. You think I did that? No. God made that <laughs> change in me. God did that for me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? All right, great. So uh, we're going to get ready to close up then. You know, uh, this has been a great study today. We don't want to force anything, right? We don't want to force anything. We want to let let uh, let the spirit have its way, let a higher power have its way. And if this is what he's got for us today, this is what he's got for us today. And this has been great for me, I'll tell you that much. Mm -hmm. So glad that you guys came out and read this book with me today. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be any place else right now, but right here with you guys. So this is how we end. Okay, page 164. <clears throat> Don't forget to join us on Telegram and uh, go to the zookrew.org for more information about the group and to listen to the podcast. Big book, page 164. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize that we know only little. God will constantly disclose more to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand him. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past, Get freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road to happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. So let's all close with the Lord's prayer. Who woke us up this morning? Oh, our Father, Father, our Father, Father Lord in heaven, Lord in heaven, holy be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom thy come. Will be done. Thy will be done. On earth on as, earth it, is as it is in heaven. Give us, give us this, give us day, this day, our day, bread. our daily bread. And give us our trespasses, our trespasses as we forgive, as we forgive, those, forgive who those who trespass, trespass against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. So next week, we will be in the next chapter. Chapter three. Chapter three. And... uh we want to know the answer to that question. We all left hanging on that question, right? Who wrote the six steps <laughs> that Bill went ahead and made the 12 steps out of? All right. 